Hello, and welcome to the second lecture of International Human Rights Law, Prospects and Challenges. Today, I'll provide a brief introduction to the history of international human rights that will set the foundation for our discussions for the remainder of this course. Specifically, I will talk about the concept of state sovereignty, one of the foundational principles of the international legal system. I'll explain why state sovereignty limited the protections available for individual and group rights prior to the Second World War. Then I'll discuss why the Second World War served as a catalyst for changing and expanding the protection of those rights, and I'll conclude with a discussion of the implications for state sovereignty and the changes thereto. So, first, to begin with state sovereignty, this is the international legal concept that attaches to every nation state and it embodies the principle that that country has the right to do what it wants within its borders. Specifically, it has the control over the territory within its borders and the individuals who reside there. A corollary to this view of sovereignty is the principle of non-intervention, and that is that other nations don't have any standing or justification to interfere in the behavior of what goes on or the conduct that goes on within the territory of another country. Now this view, rather absolute view, of state sovereignty colors the protections of rights for individuals and groups and in fact limits them because as you can imagine if the idea is that one state determines absolutely was it what it does within its own borders then how it treats its own citizens is not going to be a subject of international concern. Now as it happens prior to the Second World War there were a number of examples of instances where the rights of individuals and groups were protected. I put uh, those four major examples of this on the slide before you. Uh, they include the protection of religious minorities in uh, European principalities in the 17th century, uh, issues relating to the abolition of slavery and the slave trade, issues relating to the protection of foreign nationals who do business or reside in the territory of another country, and issues relating to the protection of religious and ethnic minorities in Central and Eastern Europe after the First World War. Now, all of these examples do have much to do with the protection of individual and group rights, but they also share one particular feature in common, and that is that the protections that individuals in state B enjoy are linked to the interests of another state, say state A. So to give you a practical example, uh, let's say there are a group of Hungarians in Romania, they're a minority in that country, well, Hungary is interested in making sure that they are well treated, uh, treated fairly in Romania. Imagine as well that there is a group of Romanians who are a majority, of course, in Romania, but a minority in Hungary. That kind of cross-border spread of minorities, whether ethnic, racial, religious, would give each of the nations involved an interest in surrendering or limiting some of its sovereignty in order to protect the minorities within the borders of the neighboring country. Uh, the same is true as well, interestingly, this sovereignty explanation for protecting individual rights. The same, it's true as well for uh, the abolition of the slave trade, because there, those countries that had abolished slavery and the slave trade were disadvantaged economically with respect to those countries that maintained the practice of owning human beings as property. And so it was in their own interest to claim that protections ought to be extended to those individuals by emancipating them. So, in sum, these different examples really were not major challenges to the principle of state sovereignty. That changed, however, uh, during the Second World War and it changed because of the massive scale of the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime in Germany against a range of different individuals and groups, including Jews, gypsies, gay men, uh, and other minorities. The Allied powers who were uh, fighting against Germany were aware of many of these atrocities but did not act to sufficiently prevent them 
or stop them from occurring once they had started. And once the full scale of these uh, atrocities became known after the war concluded, there was tremendous pressure to take some sort of action. And in particular, there was a recognition that domestic laws and institutions that protected individual and group rights were no longer sufficient to prevent governments from abusing, uh, discriminating against, or otherwise behaving violently toward uh, the individuals within their borders. Well, why might that be? Well, for one, it's entirely possible that uh, constitutions that contain individual rights could be suspended or limited. Uh, domestic institutions like parliaments or legislatures could be shut down. The courts could be staffed with judges favorable to the government in power. So in short, none of the domestic institutions were a fully effective guarantee of individual and group rights protections. And so what was uh, quickly accepted as a new idea was the recognition that we need a common understanding uh, of internationally defined rights and freedoms that would be protected through international rules and international institutions, and that this in turn required a revision of the traditional understanding of state sovereignty. Uh, and this idea of rights becoming uh, a limiting principle on state sovereignty is reflected in two different ideas that took hold after the Second World War, and they are the universalization of human rights and the internationalization of human rights. I'll say just a word about each of these before concluding the lecture. In particular, I want to draw upon the writings of one of the most eminent scholars of human rights in the 20th century, Professor Lewis Henkin, who in a book in 1990 described the universalization of rights as their spread across different national legal systems and the recognition uh, that they ought to be protected in national constitutions and laws. Now this was an idea that certainly predated the Second World War, but it was not as widespread or comprehensive as it uh, became after the Second World War. That's the idea of universalization. The idea of internationalization was that these same rights and freedoms would be protected uh, through international diplomacy, international rules, and international institutions. And this in turn served as a limiting principle on sovereignty because now any nation could say that they had an objection to the way individuals were being treated within another state's borders, even if those individuals were that state's own citizens. Now, I've just scratched the surface of the history of human rights and I certainly invite you to uh, look more deeply into these issues, and I've put up on the slide a number of sources where you might begin if you were inclined to go deeper on one particular area or another.